where are we going? We're going to Romans chapter, we're going to Romans 8 here. We're going to start there. And I think I'm, if I get this thing going, right? I have no idea if I started that or not. I guess that's good there. We're going to start over here in Romans chapter number 8. I want you to pick up with me at verse 18. One of the advantages of teaching the teens each morning or being down with the teens each morning is, the, is that, well, the disadvantage is I'm not up here in the mornings to hear the guys preaching, but the advantage is I don't have any idea what verses they preached, so I get told, they're all new to me, right? I'm, even though someone may have preached all these verses, it's first time around for me, right? But uh, anyway, these are key verses that we've looked at before at these conferences, and they're, they're so precious to each and every one of us. Verse 18, Romans 8:18, 8, he says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Bless you not our hearts in a word of prayer. Our gracious God and Father, we do thank you for the time to look into your word this evening, and we ask that as we look at this topic tonight that we've been assigned about the issue of how could evil and suffering actually exist in the world uh, where you also exist. We pray, God, that we would think about this from the standpoint and perspective of what your word tells us, so therefore that we would walk by faith in that and then, and then be edified and encouraged when these things come in our lives and the lives of other people and that we might be uh, better equipped to serve you as ambassadors and to labor together with you when not only we have need, but when those around us have need. And we'll thank you for this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, my topic tonight has to do with the issue of God, evil, and suffering. How can all exist in a creation in which God is good and loving and all-powerful? So what I want to do is I want to ask you to think about a particular situation uh, to start tonight. Looking across the room here tonight, we have a whole cross-section of, of different ages of people. Some of the things I'm going to ask may not apply so much to the younger people because just they haven't lived long enough yet. So, so when Brother Leon was up here talking about Getting out of bed at 11. They get out of bed at 11 because they're just not, they don't have no, you know, teenagers don't. Listen, Leon couldn't get out of bed because suffering. So that, so what I want you to do is this. Everyone here tonight and those listening on the internet as well, you either personally or indirectly, maybe one or two people separated from you, either personally or just one or two people separated from you, you are related to some kind of suffering. You either have it right now, as you're sitting in this room, right now, or you know someone who is. Or you have personally experienced, or you know someone, maybe one or two people removed from you, that have experienced true evil. I've told you the story before, many years ago. My sister was abducted off of her job site, like 6, 7 in the morning. The guy grabbed her, raped her, and murdered her, and left her naked body in a trash can. Devastating to my parents, broke all of our hearts. I'm not the only one in this room that something like this has happened to either directly or even two or three people removed. Several of you shaking your heads. You, you know that experience. And it changes you, doesn't it? So we want to ask the question tonight. If God is real, and if he is, as the Bible claims that he is, all-powerful and all-loving, and if he is good, then why does he allow these types of things to continue? In fact, it is, at least according to those who are atheists and are agnostic, it is their big gun of an argument, if I can say it that way. They say, if God is real, why does he allow the evil, the torture, the suffering, and in many, many cases, from a world viewpoint, innocent people, though you and I know as Bible believers, there's no one really innocent. But in many, many cases, from a human viewpoint, that suffering and that evil on innocent people. 
And if we are honest with ourselves, we have also asked similar types of questions. The, the, the saints in the book of Revelation, they, they were ex, they're, prophetically, they're going to be executed during that tribulation period. And they're up, they're up in the throne room of God and so forth. And they themselves were crying out, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? So it's not wrong for even a saint of the Most High God to pour out your heart unto God with that same question. God, the suffering is real. How long will it continue? The argument goes like this. That if God is all powerful and if he is able to stop the evil and suffering, but he chooses not to do so. Then he cannot be good. Nor can he be loving. Rather, he is callous. Or he is uncaring or he is even complicit in the evil. Or. If God is good and loving, but doesn't intervene, then he must not be able to. So therefore, he is not all powerful. Therefore, for all practical purposes in human experience, he's impotent. And therefore, for all practical experience, he is not there. After all, what good is a God who is there? but is not able. You understand the thinking? And that's true. Well, rather than the existence of evil and suffering, proving that there is no God and that he is not all powerful, not all loving, not good. In fact, let me ask you a different way. Does the existence of evil and suffering prove that God is not there? Does it prove that? Of course it doesn't. Does the existence of evil and suffering prove that God is not good? It doesn't prove that either. Does the existence of pain and suffering prove that God is not able? No, it doesn't prove any of those things. Rather, what we're going to find in the message tonight, I hope, is just the awareness of those things. Just the concept of evil, right, wrong, bad, good, just, unjust. Just those very concepts have come from somewhere. They actually demand the existence of God. And the cry of a human heart for justice demands, like, like where'd that come from? It demands that there must be a God who is just. You've heard me say before, not because it's original with me at all, the purpose of life cannot be death. The purpose of life cannot be suffering and evil. What would, what's the point of that? There must be and there is. Something beyond this life. The answer to all those questions that the human heart cries out for when it's experiencing that suffering and pain and tragedy and torment. And according to the word of God, there is. You see, the word of God makes it very, very clear. That though God himself is not the one who caused the, the suffering, the pain. He reveals some marvelous things in his word. How he is able in the midst of those things. Not just to reveal himself in a way beyond simply what the creation can reveal about him. But some ways that he can reveal himself to the non-material part of a human being. His soul to your soul. His spirit to your spirit that you can only know through experiencing things beyond simply touching the material world. Why does evil and suffering exist? Where did it actually come from? We're going to give the answer scripturally from the Bible. By the way, 
No matter what system you believe, whether you're an atheist, agnostic, Buddhist, Hindu, Muslim, you still got to explain the problem of evil and suffering because it's still here. So you still got to explain where did it come from, what's it leading to, what's the point? We're going to look at it from the standpoint of the Word of God. Because the God of the Bible, you know what he does? He just always tells us the truth about things. That's someone you can trust. That's someone you can rely upon. So the question is, first and foremost, where did suffering and evil come from? Well, according to the Word of God, what I'm going to have you do is I'm going to have you look at a couple of verses. You're in Romans, right? You're going to hold Romans 8, you're going to go to Romans 5, and you're going to go to Genesis chapter number 3. Now, the, the, we're the first part of this message, we've got to just kind of go through kind of quickly because there's just way too much to cover. And that's, I know the, all the preachers this week all have the same problem, right? <laughs> it's our suffering, okay? Look over to, uh, what I want you to do is this. Look over to Romans chapter number 5. According to the Word of God, where did human suffering come from? Look over to Romans chapter number 5 and verse 12. Wherefore, as by one, what's the next word there? Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world, and what? And therefore, everything included. The ultimate end that suffering leads to is the physical death of your body. The word of God's claim is that where suffering came from, from man. God created man with free choice. The book of Ecclesiastes says it this way, that God made man upright, but he has sought many inventions. And not good ones, by the way. <laughs> you know? the, God, the Word of God makes it very clear that for, wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon how many? All men. The common lot that all men share is not their wealth. Not their fame, not their popularity, not even their looks. Did, did you know, look around the room? Not even the looks, right? <laughs> what is the common thing that all men share? It is death, the inheritance from our father Adam. But what about evil? If you look over to Romans chapter number 8, this time go back to Romans 8. Look at this. Look at Romans 8 and verse 21. Romans 8, 21. I'm going to go back to verse 18, by the way. Here, let's look back at verse 18, and, we'll, and then we'll jump to verse 21. He says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, by the way, keep that in mind, now jump to verse 21, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the what? What's that? From what? What is the nature of the creature right now? What's it experiencing bondage of corruption. Now, when we talk about evil and suffering, we're, we're basically talking about them, and there's different ways that people categorize it, but I think the simplest way to categorize it, frankly, is in just two categories. Moral and natural. Moral suffering and evil would be the idea of torture, human torture, murder, that type of thing, and all the various sufferings associated with it. Natural suffering, evil would be things like earthquake, tsunami. Our, our part of the country, earthquakes, right? What is it out here? Hurricanes, you know? Yeah, tornadoes, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, what am I thinking? That's, uh, <laughs> who's from Florida? You guys got the hurricanes out there, right? <laughs> Folks over there. So you understand the two different categories. When we talk about moral suffering, we're talking about that which one human does to another. And we make that distinction because among the animal kingdom... If you have a, a lion that goes and eats a gazelle, no one's going to call the cops on that lion and say that guy just murdered that guy. <laughs> Why not? Somebody said it. Why? That's right. A lion is not a moral creature. When a big fish goes, eats a little fish. No one gets all upset. Well, maybe, maybe they're starting to get upset now, right? <laughs> the animal lovers and that kind of thing. And I love animals. It's, it's a shame that people get more upset about a seal in the ocean dying than a million babies being aborted every year. Unbelievable. 
Is our world confused? It's amazing. But again, when you talk about moral suffering and evil, we're talking about human to human. When you're talking about natural, you're talking about just the creation. The Word of God teaches that both exist. So the Bible, God's Word, is telling us the truth about those things. He doesn't say they don't exist. He says they're real. And they came as a result of a free will choice that Adam made. When you think about the book of Genesis, chapter number 3 here, chapter number 3, you all know the story. Adam and Eve were given a choice, a free choice, and they chose wrong. And when they chose wrong, of course, sin entered into the world. They died spiritually instantly, but physically, of course, it took some time. But notice something else that happened in Genesis chapter number 3 here. Jump down to verse 17, Genesis 3, 17. It says this, Genesis 3, 17 says this, And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I command these, uh, commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. Now understand this. The fall of Adam and Eve brought about sin, but it also brought about the curse. Those are two different things. The fall of Adam and Eve brought sin and death upon all mankind. But that verse demonstrates there was something in additional to that. And that God cursed the ground. What's the statement after curses the ground? Next statement. What's it say? What's it say? For thy sake. You ever just thought about for thy sake? Doesn't for thy sake imply for your benefit or for some help to you or some, some, something like that? So you keep that phrase in mind. We're going to come back. I want you to bring that phrase up in your mind a little bit from now on. He says, curse the ground for thy sake. There was something that God had in mind that actually was going to benefit fallen man in that he cursed the ground. Keep that in mind a few minutes from now. Let's go back to this issue of the idea of moral suffering, moral pain. Think about it this way. What is morality? What is that? Briefly, what is that? Just like one sentence. What's morality? Isn't it the awareness that something ought to be right and something is not right, therefore wrong? Like that's, that's similar to conscience. Conscience is that system of norms and standards. But morality is the awareness that everyone has that something is right Compared to something that's wrong. And really it's the opposite. Something's wrong compared to something that they think ought to be right. But think about that. Where does that idea come from? Where does the idea, the thinking that something is right, something's wrong. After all, in order for something to be wrong, what also has to be true? There has to be a standard. It is right. Where does that come from? Did that just, is it, what is it, Morris, where? It came from the God of the Bible, is the claim of Scripture. It did not come from the Big Bang. It did not come from evolution. The, the concept, the idea, the belief that something is right and wrong, just and unjust, that is not the product of just a bunch of chemical reactions going on in a mechanical b- body. It's something that's a part of the non-material part of a human being. Scripturally, you are spirit, soul, and body. Two parts of you are non-material. But in the world out there, they say, well, no, no, all you are is just a bunch of chemical reactions. Chemical reaction cannot lead you to the conclusion, a heart conclusion, an inner man conclusion, that something is just or unjust. Something is right and wrong. Uh, Chemical reactions can't lead you to that conclusion. Just because, uh, let let me quote this one guy here. I forget the guy's name, but he says this. The fact that creatures with free will choose to do evil does not prove that God is not good. How true is that? Think about it this way. The sense that we have, and when, when I'm talking about sense, I'm not talking about the sense of touch or taste or smell. I'm talking about an inner man's sense. The, the sense of 
suffering. And so we're not talking about physical suffering like when you break your arm. We're talking about the suffering in a soul when your wife passes away, the lover of your life for 35, 40, 50 years, and she's no longer there. The emptiness that you feel, the sadness, the longing. It's never the same again without her or him. That, that's not a chemical thing. Going on. That's a part of you. Some of you sitting right here today, you lost a loved one in combat in the Marine Corps. Right now today, they say that that kind of loss, it never goes away. You just have to learn to deal with it. And you still shed a tear over it, and you should. That cannot be just part of the physical part of you. That's a part of us that's non-material. That's a part of our soul and our spirit. And even unsaved people experience that same inner man cry that they don't know what it is. So that sense of suffering, that emotional pain, that, that sense of injustice and, and the things that must be made right one day, these are not part of the, the material part. These are part of the make of us, uh, make up of us uh, this non-material. If there is no God then there really is no evil or good. There really is no pain. Everything just is. How sad is that? What an empty way to live. It takes away all meaning and purpose of, of any kind of thing in your life. A relationship with another human being in the end, therefore, has no real meaning. The Bible's claim is this, that God created, therefore He is. The Bible's claim is that we live in a present evil world, so therefore God Himself acknowledges that evil exists. The Bible's claim is that we live in the sufferings of this present time. Therefore, the God of the Bible also ex acknowledges that suffering exists. He does not run from it. He does not hide from it. He does not try to explain it away. He says it's there and it's real. And if you are living on this planet, and you are, then you yourself, maybe not yet, those that are maybe younger... <laughs> But at some point, if you have not personally experienced a deep heartbreak, a deep suffering, something tragic, something terrible, you will, given enough time. Now, granted, if the rapture happens before I'm done, that's okay too, right? <laughs> you know, I bet you Brother Leon over here, I think he'd be okay if the rapture happened. He wouldn't have to drive that five-hour trip back home. Would you be okay with that? And I think we'd be all saying, okay, amen with him as well. But if the Lord tarries, if he continues to be long-suffering, as is the very nature of the dispensation of grace, which, by the way, is why he allows it to go on, even though he is able to stop it, and even though he is the God of all love, and he is a good God, he allows it to continue for a reason. We'll get to that just momentarily. But we want to ask the question now, why would... An all-loving, all-powerful, truly good God, why would he allow suffering and evil anyway? Well, of course, there are a number of reasons. If you just stop and think about it, you, you can come up with many, many reasons. The problem is people don't want to think about it. They don't want to really deal with it because of where it potentially can lead them to. But there are many, many reasons, scriptural reasons, why God would actually allow Suffering to exist in the first place. And I, I've listed just a few here. We'll see if we can get through some of these and then, and then kind of wrap this up. We're not even near done yet, by the way. Okay, but anyway. <laughs> so think about this. If, since God is, since he is all-powerful, after all, God out of nothing created everything. That, that's a little bit of power, wouldn't you say? <laughs> he is all-loving. Calvary proves it. And he is good. God who is rich in mercy for his great love where we love us. Why would he allow suffering and evil 
to exist in his creation. Why? You know, of all the reasons that you can think of, at least that I can think of, or that I read about, this and that, you know what? It seems to me the number one reason, the absolute on top of the list, as far as my pea of a brain can think about it, has to do with the fact that the God of the Bible loves liberty. And because he loves liberty, you know what he's willing to put on display? He's willing to take a chance on free will. But if he takes a chance on creatures that he gives free will to, what are the possible outcomes? Bad or good. <laughs> That's it. Go on two choices. If you are going to create a creation and give the creatures in that creation free will, then they really have to be able to choose to rebel. They re you really have to be willing to let them go. Parents, I got a question for you. Is that hard to do? Watch your kids grow up and be willing to let them fall all over themselves and fall on their face. And that's hard to do. But it's fun when you say, see, I told you so. No, you forget that. <laughs> you, know, you know. But it is. Listen, the number one reason why God would allow suffering in the first place is because he was willing to put on display in his creation by creating a creature his love of liberty. And in doing so, he gives them free will. Well, let's stay on that road for a little bit here. If you're going to give someone free will, what does that mean? What's implied? If you're going to give them free will, what's it mean? Let me try to give you an illustration. How many, how many parents do we have here today? Couples do we have here today? Okay. Uh, if and when you were thinking about having children... Did you ever think about, you know what, we're going to have these kids. They're going to be like me so they could have free will. And since they're like me, they, can, they could choose to rebel against me and not do my will. They could reject everything I believe and teach them. They could do that. Not only that, when we're thinking about having children, you think, boy, do I want to have children in this present evil world and it's getting bad right so do I want to bring up a child in not only in this kind of world but what if they rebelled against me those of you that had children and those of you that are maybe thinking about having children you still had them why why did you still have him? No, knowing that they could rebel. Knowing that they probably would suffer something in their life. Why did you still have that child? Maybe your kids are asking, yeah, dad, why? <laughs> you know? but, but why? Isn't because, it, wouldn't it be fair to say that the most essential issue as to why you wanted to have that child was because it would be an expression of your love. An extension of you, a part of you. So that, so that that child could experience this wonderful thing that we call life. And of course, as a believer, you want them to get saved and know eternal life. But in having them, you knew that they were going to fall down, skin their knee. You knew that they were going to maybe get their heart broken one day. You knew that they were going to experience some kind of suffering, some kind of failure. Some, you knew all that. And you knew that they could even rebel against what you believe. Turn their back on it and it would break your heart. But you went through it anyway. Because you wanted them to have the ability, the capacity, the potential to know love. True human compassion. You wanted them to come to the place potentially in their life. When they loved you, not because they knew they could get money from you or wash their clothes when they come back from college. But they would come to you one day and say, Mom and Dad, 
I love you. I, I love you. You you brought me into this life because you wanted me to share in something so wonderful as life and love and compassion and tenderness, and you wanted to help me see eternal life in Christ. Well, wouldn't that just you talk about the tears come gushing out of your heart, right? <laughs> but isn't wouldn't that be amazing to think about that? God creates this creation knowing that when he gave man free will, not only that they could rebel, but they would rebel. But in doing so, he does it to express the desire to so express his love for Christ and through Christ to them. He was willing to do that. So one of the main reasons that God allows suffering in this world is because it puts on display how important to him liberty is. Free will, giving creatures who are moral creatures the ability to choose. And therefore, if they choose to serve him, it will be genuine. It will be real. Think about the adversary, Satan, what he said to God about Job. Does Job serve thee for naught? That's the question. That's the debate. That's the argument. No creature will serve you out of genuineness. And God says, well, we'll we'll see. The game's not quite over yet. I think that's Alex's message the last time. The game's not over yet, (laughs) right? That last last buzzer hasn't sounded for you hockey and ducks, uh, Blackhawks and Ducks fans. It was a bad year for us, wasn't it at all? Some of you have no idea what I'm talking about, right? Hockey, hockey, different different subject. (laughs) Just understand this. When it comes to the issue of suffering and and evil, that God allows it because he loves liberty. But why else would he allow suffering? Is there any good that can come from suffering? What does suffering do in your life as a believer? What's it do? What's that? It, what's that? It builds you up, absolutely. L- look at a couple of verses here. Go with me, if you would, over to Romans chapter number 5. Look at Romans in chapter number 5 here. Look at Romans chapter number 5. Look at this passage here. He says this, verse 3, and not only so, but we glory in what? Okay, let's stop there for just a moment. When suffering or tragedy or hardship or evil comes in your life, we're going to do one of two things. We're either going to go toward God or away from God. You're going to do one of those two things, and sometimes you kind of waffle between the two. But fundamentally, that's the That's the issue. Suffering, therefore, has the capacity to show us our need, to show us our inability, to show us who God is, that we need Him. We are not independent creatures of Him. And in doing so, in showing us our need, in manifesting to us that we are not totally self-sufficient, it has the capacity to do what that verse says right there. That tribulation worketh what? Now, what is patience? What's patience? It is that. So, tribulation worketh patience, and, and patience what? What's that? What's that? You've been through something a few times. You got the scars to prove it. Tribulation work is patience and patience experience and experience what? Listen, you remember when Paul uses the word hope in the Bible? We've talked about this before. When Paul uses the word hope in the Bible, it's not the idea, well, I, well, I hope I win the lottery or I hope my team wins the game. It's the idea that, wait a minute, God said something. He cannot fail, so what he promised will come to pass. So the idea of hope Tribulation, work with patience, patient experience, experience hope, and that hope will not let us down because God will not let us down. Hope maketh not ashamed. He will not let us down. He will not abandon his word. 
What's the proof? The proof is the love of God is shed abroad in heart. Where's that? That's Calvary. Calvary not only covers it all, it proves it all. So think about it this way. If we don't know God, if we don't believe in God, we just believe that everything is here by chance, can those verses actually work in you? They can't. They absolutely cannot work in you. So when suffering and challenge and difficulty comes, we either can run to God's word or away from God's word. What have you found when you run to God's word? What have you found? What's that? Someone said comfort. What have you found when you run away from God's word? Another C word is called confusion. <laughs> All right? Chaos. Well, therefore, suffering also provides a situation to learn and grow. Watch Paul say it this way in Philippians chapter 4. Look over to Philippians chapter number 4. Philippians chapter number 4. Look at what he says at verse 11. Suffering allows... It's the classroom. It's, it's life's experience in which we can learn and grow and develop. Look at this passage here, Philippians chapter number 4. He says at verse 11, Philippians 4, 11, He says, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have what? Learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be. That's a pretty tough verse right there. I gotta, I'll admit that, right? <laughs> but you'll admit it with me too. The idea of contentment. What is the idea of discontent? What's that mean? We're unsatisfied. We want more. We think we're lacking something. But the idea of learning to be content with Christ, who is our all in all. Suffering has a way of bringing us to that classroom. By taking away from us. All the things that we depend on that are only temporary. He says, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound everywhere. And in all things I am. What's the next word there now? Instructed. See, verse 12. I know, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound everywhere. And in all things I am. There it is. Instructed both to be full and to be hungry. Both to abound and to suffer need. And then verse 13. I can do all things. Through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Suffering, tragedy, hardship brings us to that classroom where there's a course of instruction from the Word of God that's able to teach us, bring us to the place where we are willing to say, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Therefore, suffering has the capacity to bring us to the place where we quit trusting in ourselves. Oh, what a long, painful journey. We're still on it, aren't we? <laughs> oh, Lord, to, to arrive there sooner. Amen. Oh, Lord, to get that, to, to that destination more quickly. It, it, do, you, do you realize how often our prayers contradict? Because on the one hand, we say, well, but, but I say, Okay, maybe I shouldn't say this about you. You guys are way further ahead spiritually than I am. But on the one hand, I say, Lord, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And the, oh, no, let's leave the next part out, Lord. I'm not quite interested in that part. We say, Lord, bring me to the place where I learn that I can do all things through Christ that strengthen me. But, but not too fast, Lord. I don't know if I can handle the pain that quickly. And, you know, the Lord is so gracious but it, because he says, okay. Just, we'll take it as you're ready. But sometimes when evil and tragedy comes, you're not quite ready. And he says, but I've got you all along. I'm right there with you. Some of you right here know what I'm talking about spiritually, experientially. You know it personally. Because you had things happen in your life that you were completely unexpecting to happen. And they happened. And you were brought to that place real quickly where you had to say, Lord, all I can say is, Christ too is my strength. Christ is my all. Your grace is sufficient to me for me. Lord, help me to understand that verse because I desperately need it now. Suffering brings us to the edge of, of time and, and on the edge of eternity because it brings us to the place where we have to acknowledge and recognize that the sufferings of this present time 
are not worthy to be compared with what? Glory that shall be revealed in us. So it brings us to the, to, to the edge of time and, in, and into eternity where we can say with God and agree with what he says, believe what he says, that though the outer man perishes, yet the inward man is renewed day by day while we look, what? Not at the things which are seen. That's in time. But the things which are not seen, that's out here in the ages to come. For the things which are seen are temporal. Sometimes they don't feel like it. The pain goes on and on and on. But when we look at him from God's perspective, the things out here are eternal. So what happens is that it actually works for us. A far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Brother Jordan was talking about the glory of God. God's willingness to, sh- to have us share in his plan to glorify Christ. And God says, though I did not make the choice for Adam. And though I did not make Adam make that choice. Suffering came in. Affliction came in. The curse came in. And I can use that to bring forth my plan to glorify Christ. And for you to participate with him in that. This is a good deal, folks. This is like better than any investment program out there. Any savings plan. Any retirement. This is eternal retirement plan. This is pretty good stuff. Suff- you know what else suffering does? Go with me quickly to 2 Corinthians 1. 2 Corinthians chapter number 1. 2 Corinthians 1. Watch this. You know what else suffering does? Suffering allows us, it enables us to be useful to others. Look at this verse. Verse 3, blessed be the God and even the Father of our Lord. I'm at, I'm at 1, 3, 2 Corinthians. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all. What's that word there? I got a question quickly. Think about Romans chapter number one, where Paul, where, talk, where Paul talks about that in the creation and in the creation of man, that all men know two fundamental things about God. They know his eternal power and his Godhead, right? In the creation. That verse tells us, and 2 Corinthians tells us, that there's some things that we get to know, we learn about God that you cannot know about God simply from the creation. In this passage, you learn some things about God and his capacity to comfort you, to console others. But you learn that in need, in experiencing the suffering. And therefore, in experiencing that, verse 4 says, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, why that we may be able to, that we can be useful to other members of the body of Christ and not just to other members of the body of Christ, but we can be useful to the loss. That we may be able to comfort them, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the same comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. So do you see that, that? We learn some things about the nature of God that we could not learn otherwise. Now, let me ask you a question. There are many more reasons why God will allow suffering, but we have to move on. If I was to ask you, what was the greatest evil and the greatest suffering that any human being ever ever experienced in all of human history, what would you say it was? What was it? Someone said it. Some of you all said it. Christ crucified. Think about the different ways that the Word of God describes what happened to the man, Christ Jesus, who was God in human flesh. He was absolute God, but absolute man. And as a man, it says that he was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. 
He was beaten, brutalized, bruised, mocked, spit upon, shamed publicly. They put a crown upon his head to, in mocking, a crown of thorns. They pierced his hands and his feet. And they hung him on the cross, suspended between heaven and earth for the angels and all mankind to see, to say to God, we don't want you or your son. They poured out the extent of human suffering and human torture and human evil on the prince of life and killed him. And they said things like, we have no king but Caesar. What a desire. What a claim. What a choice. I want you to think about this. Go with me quickly to Genesis 6. Go to Genesis chapter number 6. Sometime take and just read and meditate upon Psalms 22. When the psalmist David prophesying about the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, he gives in 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 amazing detail the suffering that the man Christ Jesus experienced in spirit and soul and body. He describes someone going through utter dehydration. His, 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 his bones are all out of joint because the, the, the tendons and, and ligaments are all stretched. He got no moisture in the body anymore. His heart is melting like wax with him, and he's going through a heart congestion, heart failure. All the physical things he's going. And then on that cross, he cries, My God! My God, why hast thou forsaken me? And the heavens were silent. God didn't break through the heavens and send the angels to rescue him. The angels probably themselves stood in awe. What happened here? Think about this. In Genesis 6, when God has Moses write the details about what brought the flood, we're told this in Genesis 6, verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Listen, this was way back in Genesis 6. We've lived a few years since then. And the human population has, has multiplied since then. It's over, what, 7 billion people today. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of souls. That's a lot of wickedness in men multiplied upon the face of the earth. Look at the next verse. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. Now look at that next statement. And it grieved him where? Can I suggest it this way? That if back then in Genesis 6, when God looked upon the sea of humanity, he saw the, the wickedness, the sin, the rebellion, the suffering man upon man. It grieved him at his heart. How come? He looks down the portals of history. He knew that the population will once again multiply and increase and do the same thing. And he knew that all that wickedness, all that sin, all that rebellion, all that torture and pain and suffering would one day be poured out collectively for all of mankind on his own beloved son. He spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. It grieved God at his heart all right. Not just because he saw the wickedness of man, but because he saw that wickedness of man that he himself was going to place upon the body, soul, and spirit of his only beloved son. He was going to hear his son say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why are thou so far from the words of my roaring? I cry in the daytime, and thou hearest not, and in the night season, and I am not silent. 
And then he, he hears his son give the answer back saying, but thou art holy. I just wonder what had to have been going through the heart of God as he had to let the wrath fall. He stayed not his hand. He had to keep the angels back as it were. He had to go through with the cross. Can anything good come out of suffering? Well, how, what happened three days later? Jesus Christ rose from the dead, conquered death, grave, and hell. The greatest suffering, the greatest tragedy, the greatest torture ever that any man ever committed and combined committed happened at Christ crucified. The Godhead put on display free will. The free will of the Father to give the Son. The free will of the Son to give Himself. No man taketh my life. I lay it down of myself. And the free will of the Holy Spirit, who Hebrews says He, 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 he uh, eternally sacrificed. They put on display the free will nature of the Godhead that we learned about last night from Brother Jordan's message. They said, you want to see that? It's right there on the cross. Suffering absolutely has some amazing benefits. Coal under great pressure produces diamonds. A speck of sand in the oyster produces a pearl. And the wrath of Almighty God on the Son of God brought forth life and righteousness. He was delivered for our, just, uh, for our offenses and was raised again. Why? For our justification, the Word of God says. God is a God of love. Calvary proves it. He is a God who is all-powerful. He raised Jesus Christ from king death. And He is good because He gave Him so. Suffering will not go on forever. It cannot. It must not. The cross proves it. For the present dispensation of grace, he lets it go on. You know why? Because he continues to put on display his capacity to suffer long. First Timothy 1, 16, right? He might set forth all long suffering. This dispensation will come to an end one day. It hasn't yet. What's that mean? It means many, many things, but you and I have the opportunity right now, right here, right today. In every situation that happens, is just to say, Lord, I can learn more. I need to trust you more. Not because I'm under the law, but because I'm under grace. Because I'm under grace, you allow me the great privilege to live this life you've given me freely in the Lord Jesus Christ. How should we then live? Should we live with the belief that when suffering and tragedy happens in your own life and the heavens are silent, God doesn't seem to answer your prayers, you seem, you seem all alone. Should we conclude that we are alone? Of course not. Rather, we need to go to the Word of God. Trust his word. He is the living God. Let me conclude with this question. Can you think of a place where no suffering and evil actually exists and at the same time where absolute, true, unfettered free will does exist? Think about that. People say, well, heaven. Well, uh, uh, not presently because part of the heavens are still in rebellion. Right? Well, on earth, I, I, I think not. <laughs> Certainly not in hell. Is there a place anywhere in this universe where suffering, evil, pain does not exist, but true, free will, unfettered, does exist? I think I heard someone say it. If you listened to Brother George's message last night, you heard the answer. Someone's right there. Where is it? In the Godhead. Among the Godhead. They live in absolute unfettered 
free will love towards each other. They live spontaneously for each other. And there's no evil and suffering there. We have been invited, indeed made partakers of, the glory. God's plan called glory to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. To be in that and to be there forever. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you for the time that we could look a little bit in your word tonight to gain insight and wisdom about this issue of suffering and evil and pain and and more so to gain the wisdom and insight that you give us from your word about eternal glory, the sufferings, the difficulties, the challenges that we face now. Though you didn't cause them, you took them. Your son took them willingly upon himself so that we could share in his glory. We'll thank you for this in Christ's name. Amen.